Dr. Sharon Harley is an associate professor at the University of Maryland College Park. Her book manuscript, Empowered by Their Own Doing, Black Women's Imagined Reality of Gender Evenness in Jim Crow America, 1862 to 1920, is under review. Currently, she is under contract with Yale University Press to complete a book in their Black Lives series, tentatively titled Nanny Helen Burroughs, Standing Up for Justice. Polity Press invited her to write a biography about civil rights activist Gloria Richardson. Dr. Harley co-edited and contributed notable essays to the pioneering anthology, The Afro-American Woman, Struggles and Images. Other pioneering texts followed it. She edited and contributed to two anthologies, Sister Circle, Black Women in Work, and Women's Labor in the Global Economy, Speaking in Multiple Voices resulting from two major Ford Foundation grants. Harley served as pr principal investigator of a Ford Foundation seminar, Women of Color and Work Research Seminar from 2002 to 2006, and was co-editor and contributor to Women in Africa and the African Diaspora. She has held fellowships at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for scholars in the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute of, uh, at Harvard University's Hutchins Center and the National Humanities Center at the Research Triangle, North Carolina, and the Smithsonian. Dr. Harley has delivered papers at professional history and women's conferences in the United States and scholarly meetings in South Korea, Ireland, France, Spain, Italy, Ghana, South Africa, Abu Dhabi, and China. Over the course of her scholarly career, she has delivered numerous speeches on a range of topics, including Dr. Martin Luther King and women civil rights leaders. Um, in December 2019, Dr. Harley's proposal for an interdisciplinary African Black Diaspora Studies Academic and Public Discourse Seminar led to the University of Mar Maryland receiving a $500,000 Mellon Foundation grant. She is the grant's principal investigator and project director. Uh, Dr. Harley, thank you so much for being here with me today, um, with us today. So, um, you know, we're going to go over talking about your career, um, your experiences, um, your research and writing. But uh, if it's okay with you, I did want to start off a little more personally um, and ask you about your upbringing, where you're from. Uh, what some of your experiences were growing up, um, if you don't mind sharing. Uh, so I grew up in Washington, D.C., and part of my early upbringing is revealed in the Deborah Gray White Telling Our Histories and, um, volume. And it's really, that was a very exciting uh, volume because it had academics, people who do work, primarily in Black women's history, talk about how they came to uh, write in that field. And it was more challenging than one might imagine. I think it's easy to talk about your career and your upbringing, but to write it for all to see, it was a little more challenging. But what it helped me to think about is that I grew up in uh, Washington, D.C. I'm uh, what Washingtonians would consider a second uh, third generation Washingtonian, my daughter's a fourth generation Washingtonian, and my students often ask about the significance of that. And I said, probably no significance, it's just a, something that people boast about. <laughs> but I grew up in a, a Catholic uh, household. I thought about that because I think maybe some of my interest in working class people, social justice, women's issue, issues were partly due to growing up Catholic, where there is some concern. I'm not going to go into things that's problematic about that, but one of the things that I greatly admired is, is interest in the poor and helping the poor, and, and that's something my mother uh, encouraged my sister, tw identical twin sister, myself, and my brothers to be concerned about the poor and to give. So I grew up in Washington. I, uh, my sister and I were star field hockey players in Washington, D.C. I only talk about that because I go to undergraduate school in Indiana to play field hockey, mm -hmm. only to discover they don't have a field hockey team. 
So when I was associate dean of undergraduate studies at the University of Maryland, one of my most engaging speeches was make sure your graduate school has a field hockey team. In other words, I should have done my research. But all I knew is my sister was going to Howard University. I wanted to go to a school different from my sister. Um, and, you know, I probably should have gone to Howard and to HBCU because it was a challenge to go to school in Indiana, a Catholic women's college uh, from DC. So I think it affected the trajectory of both my personal and my political life because there was no field hockey team. There's also not much in way of a social life. And my roommate was from Chicago and she introduced me to various aspects of the Black Panther Party. Many of my students are shocked when I show, show, them, show them a photo of me selling Black Panther papers and that kind of stuff. So that was uh, part of my undergraduate experience. And I had not gone to HBCU, had gone to Oberlin for a master's. So my sister thought I was culturally deprived. Um, I eventually go to uh, HBCU to get a PhD. And most people do the reverse. They go undergraduate. And that's where I met my good friend and cherished friend, Rosalind Turborg Penn. And it was a lifetime of sisterhood and uh, being introduced to diaspora in a way that I had not really been introduced to. And it meant switching my focus from the political economy of slavery in Brazil to writing about Black women's history. So that is, in many ways, in the personal aspects of my life intertwine as I do research and interact with people. And so that may come up in some of your questions. Yeah, you, uh, it was really interesting to learn about your trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, some of my questions were about, um, did any of those experiences growing up inspire you to become a historian? And you talked a little bit about your um, Catholic upbringing, mm -hmm. but if there is anything else that kind of inspired you to go mm -hmm. for the PhD. Yeah. I, I think, um, you know, when I was in high school and DC public schools, I didn't know that there was such a thing called tracks. So there was an academic college prep track and a sort of middle one and one for people who were going to go into trades. I thought everybody was going to go to a, you know, a college. And I didn't really know, know that until later. My sister and I kind of, you know, we just assumed it because people in our track were all going to college that everybody was going to college. But the, the point is, is that we had a well, a rigorous academic public school experience. Um, and we had these wonderful teachers who were really quite talented. And the, what people know intermittently is that uh, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham's mother was head of the social studies division for the DC public schools. And I uh, uh, became a public school teacher. I had teachers all along, you know, the public schools here and probably other places as well that were very rigorous and they were very good. And I had social studies teachers that I greatly admired. So I had long interest in history or mathematics and college math was slightly different from, <laughs> from high school yeah. math, even though I was really good. Um, so I went to um, follow up my interest in history. And I hadn't, as I said, plan to write about Black women's history was no such field. I had plans to write about the political economy of slavery because I was always interested in kind of radical politics and interacting with a friend from Chicago who knew Fred Hampton then introduced me to Black Panther Party. So I go out to a Catholic women's college to play field hockey and look preppier than any person you can imagine. And I leave there with the Angela Davis size bush <laughs> and selling Black Panther papers and my leather jacket. And my parents kind of wondered what had happened to me. But see, if I had gone to Howard, I probably would have had a more well-rounded life and not had to. Um, uh, but I, for me, being involved in the Black Panther Party, uh, more intertwined with my interests. I write particularly about women I consider radical, not just radical in terms of politics, but radical in terms of identity, radical in terms of class, radical in terms of 
you know, a range of sexual identities and radical for that time period. So for whatever reason, I end up writing about uh, women who uh, don't uh, fulfill any standard trajectory. And so I'm just always right. And, and, and if they don't start that way, mm -hmm. I make them radical in the course of doing research. So I even made somebody like Mary Church Terrell, a radical, a genteel radical. <laughs> and I make you know, people like Lori Richards and all these people I write about. What interests me is their, um, their lack of interest in conforming to a traditional way of life and traditional thinking. So I always had to have them a little bit on the edge. Yeah. So um, I really love that. And that was going to be one of my later points that I wanted to bring up, but I'll just bring it up now since we're kind of talking about it. Um, but one of the things that I admire so much about you and your work mm -hmm. is that um, you're not afraid to really uh, go and um, talk about a range of things. So you said, you know, radical women broadly, but you know, you've written about um, black women's cultural production, labor, electoral politics, um, internationalism. Uh, these days in graduate school and like early career, people really, um, you know, I'm talking for myself, but then also yeah. anecdotally with people, for people that I know, um, our mentors kind of tell us to like stay in our lane. Mm -hmm. um, and so mm -hmm. that leaves no room for us to like go and um, kind of look at our into other intellectual like curiosities. So um, I just want to ask just some like advice for, you know, early career people mm -hmm. that maybe, you know, they're doing one thing, but they have interests in, in yeah. uh, some other mm -hmm. subjects that might be a little too, ch not tangential enough to what they're doing. Yeah, good question. I often, then think there was something about going to Howard University that, and maybe at the time we went to Howard, that there was no such field called Black women's history. So Rosalind Torborg Penn and I said, well, and she first, because she got me to switch from my trajectory to, to this field called Black women's history. And there were there was not enough opposition among the faculty at Howard to this because they didn't have a clue about what we were doing. And I'm not sure how much we had a clue. So we sent out, let's say, 20 book proposals and got, let's say, 19 rejections. And we got one yes. And so um, that one yes, and I now have in my possession uh, royalty checks to Bernice Johnson Reagan from Sweet Honey in the Rock for $25. We're so happy. Philomena showed me steady, had a piece. And so most of the contributors were our fellow graduate students, uh, you know, like Cynthia Neverdon Morton and Rosalind Torborg Penn. So we knew that we needed to contribute something to that field because we couldn't go to women's history conferences and complain about their not having stuff about Black women's history. We had to do it ourselves. And so we were so happy to get a contract from. Kennecott Press and a really small, very uh, modest uh, honorarium. And then the rest is history because it becomes the kind of the pioneer tax. And then Roz and I went on and got some money from NEH and we did that book on women in the diaspora. Yeah. So we just, um, we had the confidence we could do it. We had enough fellow graduate students I, nobody really said we couldn't do it. And so we just went ahead and did it. And then over the years, I've had the good fortune to work with a, a range of interested scholars and to do other works. And so the Ford grants and the Rockefeller grants, and now more recently, the Mellon grants are a result of scholars in various disciplinary fields who I have collaborated with and worked with. And so I think one of my monikers is as a uh, a person who brings people together. And so I bring people together uh, with a Ford grant. I bring people together initially at a, a, a party at my house. And it turns out there are 20 people there. And 18 of them are writing about some aspect of Black women's work writ large that produced one Ford grant, then another Ford grant. So I think it's a combination of being in the right place at the right time, having such 
wonderful sister scholars. And then over the years, I've brought people together and write us retreats at my sister's house at Martha's Vineyard. And so it's just been, you know, wonderful to work with such uh, engaging and committed uh, scholars. And uh, so I greatly, I just so, uh, you know, love being a Black women historian and interacting with a cross-section of people who do this work. And I think one of the benefits of being in African-American studies departments or women's studies or gender studies is that by its very nature is inter interdisciplinary. And so you don't really have to convince people that you should be doing this. You don't have to convince people that race is important or gender or sexuality. That's a given, you can do your work. And so in that framework, I do my work, but I'm always looking for that radical cutting edge aspect of uh, Black women's lives. So if I'm writing about a woman who was a numbers backer, I write about her because she's, she's not gonna let anybody determine what her career path is. And she came from a upper middle-class black family, but she's gonna tell you what her life was gonna be like. <laughs> and so these are the kind of people I like writing about. Yeah. yeah. Um, and just to follow up kind of more on this, uh, you talked about um, kind of like a sisterhood of mm -hmm. uh, scholars. And um, I just want to know you know, kind of more about the collaborations that you've done, um, mm -hmm. especially with, you know, the groundbreaking anthology, the African, or excuse me, Afro-American woman struggles and images um, mm -hmm. with the late and dearly missed Dr. Rosalind Turbert Penn. Um, just like any memories or experiences yeah. about that. I just remember being walking across the Howard campus with mm -hmm. Rosalind and then we would walk and we'd get lunch from someplace and then we'd go to the Library of Congress and they probably hadn't seen that many scholars at the Library of Congress. There were about maybe at least 14 or 15 from Howard alone and with Sylvia Jacobs and a whole slew of people. So, you know, Roz and I uh, just thought we could do these works. We were not gonna continue to go to Burke's and other women's history conferences and then complain that people don't talk about Black women. And I remember there was a session on women's suffrage. And Rosalind's furious because they weren't talking about Black women's suffragists. Mm -hmm. And I, so Rosalind then would give me a whole history of why they should talk about Black women. Not only were the Black women suffragists, but they were at the very meeting that the people were talking about. Mm -hmm. So rather than continue to be furious, we got together. We got our fellow graduate students to contribute pieces to that volume. So one of Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham's first article was in our uh, volume. So it was just, it was, we just didn't know that we shouldn't do it. We couldn't do it. We knew it had to be done. And so Ross and I just did it. And, you know, um, happy that one publisher sent us a, a yes. And then the book was reprinted and reissued by Black Classic press and so we had a book signing with uh, uh, another prominent novelist and I would tell my students that it was there were like a thousand people there at this Black Claxit Press um, book signing in Baltimore and we said it was Walter Mosley mm -hmm. and we said we were joking of course that Walter Mosley was writing our coattails well we realized at that meeting that book signing luncheon in Baltimore with a thousand people. Mm -hmm. uh, 990 were for Walter Mosley and the other 10 were our relatives and friends, but not really. But we did have a couple of book signings. We dedicated the book to the noted librarian and scholar, Dorothy Porter. Mm -hmm. uh, I have actually a, a photograph of Rosalind and myself uh, giving a signed book to Dorothy Porter. Uh, Wesley and Charles Wesley and all the fabulous people who were there. So we, you know, I, for me, I think it's a gift that we were at this place at this time. And we had people who s supported us like Dorothy Porter Wesley, who, you know, collected all of these manuscripts that we could use. So, you know, I, I just think there's just being in the right place at the right time, having all these blessings and then having, you know, great, sister scholars that we could work with and some brother scholars too. <laughs> yeah, so um, 
was that experience, um, especially like at Howard University, do you believe, you know, um, obviously always being at an HBCU will always be a unique experience, but. Um, do I don't you... think that we would have been able to do this at a predominantly white uh, mm -hmm. school or graduate program. I think it's, as you described, they're uh, more set in what you can do and can't do, mm -hmm. that you have to follow a kind of more narrow path. I think most of the people at Howard didn't even know what we were doing <laughs> in the sense that um, they didn't know much about Black women's history mm -hmm. and we had the freedom to do it. And Rosa was, you know, had already been teaching for years at Morgan. I was kind of new, the social studies teacher. And I often think about the number of our colleagues who were social studies teachers. And that was um, uh, Ellen Brooks Higginbotham and other people. So I think being there, uh, gave us uh, the confidence that we could do it, and we didn't never thought we couldn't do it, and so uh, that's how we ended up doing. But I think at some other school we would have been told no, we couldn't do it. I have, you know, there are great students at Maryland who who are told they can't do this and they can't do that, and you know, you do that later. Now I think there's some we were able to do it also because it was such a new field. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, but I, I'm not sure how anybody could really complete a PhD or a dissertation in particularly about women's issues and history or uh, without being interested and yeah. having the flexibility. But I know people want you to be straight and narrow and get it done mm -hmm. and then do all these innovative, creative things in your books. And I, so I, I, I can understand that. But the good news is there are places, for instance, like Rutgers and other places mm -hmm. where you have a lot more flexibility, a lot of great scholars who are historians, but doing a variety of things. And so Rosin was also the one who had introduced more, more to the diaspora. Mm -hmm. She was had family members from Suriname. Uh, Rosa knew many more of the African uh, students than I did. I'm, you know, from DC, and so <laughs> DC has its own little social world. <laughs> and so, Rosa said, "Rosa, please be with." She said, "Well, because I'm from Suriname, and so, so, how it was the place where there are a lot of people from the diaspora. My uh, identical twin sister went to Howard. She." loves Howard mm -hmm. and she um, has a law degree from Howard and she raises lots and lots of money from Howard and so she just kept saying I was culturally deprived because I hadn't gone to HBCU I hadn't gone to Howard even though she supports me at Maryland but if mm -hmm. he let the dean know when I was uh, for a long time maybe 12 13 years I was chair of African American studies at mm -hmm. University of Maryland, my sister, who's a big fundraiser, would say to the dean, well, I'm only really doing this because my sister's chair of African-American studies because I raise money for Howard. Mm -hmm. and so the dean didn't seem to mind because she also raised money for, to help me as well. So yeah, good sister. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So um, I did have a question, excuse me, mm -hmm. about um, your early career um, mm -hmm. in obstacles that you face as a Black woman um, in the academy and how you overcame them? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't, I don't want to go into, let me see. Um, for the most part, when I first started, there were so few Black women scholars in African-American studies departments. So, you know, I Tracy, the good thing is that I always set my own path. And if I didn't get the academic support and encouragement at where I was, then there was always the beautiful Library of Congress. So Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham and I went to the Library of Congress and the late Gerald Gill from Tufts, we went to the Library of Congress every day. We'd get there at 8.30, it would close at 8.30 at 9 p.m. We'd leave there and go to Georgetown and continue our, our research. So I had a wonderful community of scholars from all over at the Library of Congress. So if I was at a place that didn't have the academic rigor or enrichment I needed, 
I'm going to be at the Library of Congress, and then you could get a study desk. So it was David Lewis and Lawrence Levine. Everybody was at the Library of Congress, and we were down there. In fact, I was down there so many, so many days and so long. My sister said people thought I worked there. <laughs> she said, I try to um, uh, assure them that my sister doesn't work at the Library of Congress. She's a scholar <laughs> at the Library of Congress. <laughs> so I, I think for me, if you don't get what you want at a particular institution or time, then it's really incumbent upon you to find the community that's supportive. You know, for me, academic rigor has always been um, a hallmark of what I aspire to and the kind of people I interact with. So my thinking is when I was chair of African American studies, in academic units where there's a lot of confusion, that means people not doing the work they should be doing. Because yeah. if they're doing their work, they don't have time for confusion or anything. So uh, so when I was chair of African-American studies for many, many years, I just encouraged academic rigor and supported people in that vein. And so that minimized the politics. I mean, it's not that politics is not associated with academic rigor either. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, if you're doing your work, you just really don't have a lot of time for confusion. So that's sort of been. Mm -hmm. So I was at, at, at I was at Maryland. I got other offers, then. But they, you know, I said to myself, why would I go somewhere else when my mom's here, my sister mm -hmm. is here? I, Places don't have as many wonderful restaurants yeah. <laughs> as as, the, um, as Washington D.C. has. So I would go away when I was at, uh, and still go away for postdoc fellowships, whether it's at Harvard or the Research Triangle or different places. Mm -hmm. And so for me, my trajectory has included teaching or being an administrator and being on leave every three years, give or take, mm -hmm. with a postdoc. Because, you know, as you know, academic work is hard. It is, and it's yeah. a lot. And so mm -hmm. you have to get a postdoc mm -hmm. so you can have the time. And the beautiful thing about you younger scholars is that you have these um, dissertation uh, doctoral uh, fellowships, and you have these early fellowships, which were mm -hmm. really, really nice. I mean, the immediate post advance post, I'm sorry, <laughs> the post, uh, that's probably uh, 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 not unintended. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you, you have these fellowships that you can have for two years to finish your pro book projects before mm -hmm. you start teaching. And I think that's absolutely wonderful. Uh, so you can do it. And, and the beautiful thing is we often, uh, uh, you know, all the sister scholars, a lot of the work that we did in terms of administrative work. You guys don't, hopefully, because you, so you won't have to do it. You can get out there. And <laughs> so he, we often laugh and say, you guys say no. And we would like, we would have to say yes, because it wouldn't get done. So mm -hmm. I want younger scholars and colleagues to know, we admire your ability just to not do any of the stuff that we had to do. <laughs> To make sure there yeah. was a real, I mean, I was chair for so many years at mm -hmm. the uh, African American Studies to make sure we had an African American Studies department. And I got all of these grants. It took a lot of time because I want to make sure that we were at the same uh, level as other academic units. So, in many ways, I sacrificed um, and delayed some publications. Mm -hmm to make sure that the scholars in my department uh, were tenured, were promoted. I subsequently learned that I probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> so, so I am mad that a number of the younger colleagues are not taking administrative positions, uh, not doing all these things until they get all their books out and then uh, they can do it. So, but I think, uh, Many of us laid the groundwork so you wouldn't have to do that or because we also didn't have a choice. Yeah, we definitely thank you for <laughs> your sacrifices. And it's still so impressive, um, yeah. you know, everything that you were able to produce, um, mm -hmm. you know, despite having to, to right. do all these um, right. extra. But it also means you're probably working seven days a week. You know, I remember somebody said to my significant other, uh, some 
something like, uh, your wife only works, only teaches two days a week. And he said, oh, but she works seven days a week. Yeah. So when people are not in the academy, they just see that yeah. you have two day mm-hmm. teaching schedule. They don't know all the work involved just to teach, yeah. let alone to support an academic record. And so, mm-hmm. I mean, actually I said, I went to the academy to, just to be a scholar and ended up being an administrator and a director of a number of grants. And so I, but I never gave up uh, for me, the scholarly part. I just kept publishing in addition to that. And that's, and I, and I still greatly love it. And I describe uh, this to my undergraduate students, my graduate students, because I really want them to think about the academy and get a PhD. And I used to make it mandatory that they get a library conference a resource uh, reference uh, card, whether they were ever going to go back again, but uh, maybe they did. Some, some, a couple have gone off of PhDs. Okay, nice. Mm-hmm. And so how do you feel that you've been able to balance all of this? <laughs> um, well, that's a good question. I think that one of the benefits of having grants is that you can buy out a course. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the so you can buy it, of course, to get your work done. Um, people who know my identical twin sister, her name is Sheila Harley Washington. She has a whole social life, and I can sort of know about that social life and occasionally participate because I think it's also important to have a you know balanced life. Um, but I I love so much what I do, so it's easy for me to uh, you know work seven days a week uh, on my academic work and in support of particularly uh, women scholars and scholars of color. So I, I don't know. I just, uh, I, I dearly love being an academic. Uh, I, I love the discovery process. I love, I often describe to my students, you know, walking from the Library of Congress to my car and then my theoretical framework comes to me as I'm walking to my car. So I'm thinking about Gloria Richardson. I'm thinking about writing about her. But how, with this uh, piece I have in the VP Franklin and Betty Collier Thomas book, of uh, uh, edited volume, I thought about how she foretold uh, aspects of the civil rights and Black power movement. I'd like finding that edge. Mm-hmm. And so, and I'm always looking for the edge. So if I'm writing about more recently about Queen Mother Moore, who uh, I know um, it's, people are writing great biographies to her. I really want to talk about what made her significant. What was the human dimension of hers and how in many ways she didn't have the same trajectory as Anna Julia Cooper and other people who were well-educated because she advocated for the working class. And so I'm always looking for the courageous ways in which the women that I write about function, because I'd like to see myself as operating like that. So I often say, if you, and I remember Dr. Mary Frances Berry was on my dissertation committee, and she would say, if you are at a meeting and at a place, and if you don't speak up, then you know you should speak up. You should share your views, and not just sit there. And so I had the reputation of, you know, smiling just like I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. And one of my uh, associate dean colleagues would say, and then that people would be bleeding, but they didn't know that you had cut them because you're smiling the whole time you let them mm-hmm. have it. So, so I, but that's not necessarily my intention. My intention is. If you don't advocate for people of color or women scholars or transgender scholars or mm-hmm. people who need to be advocated for, including for me, poor white students from Appalachia, what, why are you there? You're not just there to be you know, interacting with people. You can do that with your friends or your family members. I'm there to advocate for uh, women's equality and justice. And so that's part of you know, what I do. Yeah, you're not only, you know, researching and writing about people who are doing this work, you're actively doing it. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you about um, your more recent work, um, anything that you want to talk about, but also um, 
your upcoming manuscript, Imagine Reality of Gender Evenness, the Nexus mm -hmm. of Race, Gender, and Women's Work. Okay. So I, I have been working on that project for a number of years because even though I may it appear that it's all manageable, you you sacrifice the your ability to complete, especially monographs when you're doing other things. My feminist thinking about the price that Black women paid for race loyalty was not a fully accurate depiction of the ways in which Black women negotiated gender and often in a hidden way. So I uh, have a piece about my mother, you know, passing my father the salt and I'm all upset saying to my mother, why can't you let him get his own salt? So, of course, by that time I've graduated from college, I wasn't saying that before. So my mother thinks is like, you know, you're not going to come with, you know, with your college degree <laughs> and your feminist thinking and wreck this happy home. This has worked for me. <laughs> so then, of course, I knew I had to move. And that was the only reason why I needed to move. I needed to move because I couldn't stay out all night. Uh, my father didn't care if you were a public school teacher or what. You couldn't stay out all night uh, in his house. So, but the, the bottom line is that I, the new project uh, looks at how we negotiate gender. It's not that Black women are paying a price for race loyalty or deferring to Black men. They negotiate it. So the book is really about gender negotiate, negotiation. So late um, post-emancipation to 1920s. So I'm telling that story but in a way that women empower themselves by their adeptness Mm -hmm. and renegotiating and empowering themselves often unbeknownst to their significant other. Mm -hmm. uh, my new project is a part of the Black Lives series that Yale's doing is on Nanny Helen Burroughs. I had written about Nanny Helen Burroughs for the Journal of African American History. Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham had written about Nanny Helen Burroughs. And then more recently when I wrote about it, in a book on women in the global economy, we were in, I had a Ford and Rockefeller grant and we were at the Bellagio Conference Center in Bellagio, Italy. And I was, I was writing about race women and they included um, Billie Holiday, uh, Shirley Graham Du Bois, Louise Thompson Patterson, and Nanny Helen Burroughs. But I was gonna delete Nanny Helen Burroughs because I didn't think she was radical enough. Mm. She wasn't a communist, she wasn't a socialist, but fortunately, um, uh, Elsa Barkley Brown was there. She was in that seminar and she convinced me, and I'm so happy and I say this repeatedly to my students, she convinced me that I needed to include Nanny. And in fact, Nanny may have been the most radical of these women because she had to function in the black male church arena. And you had to be uh, strong and radical. So it may have been easy to be radical in the framework of the Communist Party, even though the largest society consists, consists of that radical, but what Nanny was. And so in the new book, I'm talking about the multiple lives of, of Nanny Helen Barrows. And when I did the piece for the Journal of African American History, it's much like Gloria Riches and these women were so popular doing their activist days only to be in some ways not forgotten but lit, written less about so whenever people would ask me to give a talk on Martin Luther King for Martin Luther King's birthday but I would always bring some women with me I get to talk about Gloria Richardson and how Gloria Richardson I know the people probably said we paid her to do a talk about Nanny Helen Barrows <laughs> I mean about Martin Luther King she's talking about Gloria Richardson <laughs> how Gloria Richardson influenced uh, King and he so um you know, that's sort of what I do. <laughs> I always have to tell the complete story. And the complete story is really without a woman's voice, a woman's influence, and a women's uh, pioneer role that gets excluded because we got to keep talking about, and wonderful people we talk about, King. But we cannot talk about King without talking about the women who had more progressive thinking before it came to, uh, to King. So um, just kind of on that note, but um, moving 
forward to thinking about the future of mm -hmm. African American women's history. Mm -hmm. um, where do you see it going? Uh, what excites you most about um, today's Black women historians and the work that they're doing? Um, well, I'm doing more kind of in the global context, more in diaspora. So my Mellon grant uh, enabled me to bring these fabulous women scholars uh, to uh, Ghana uh, in a collaboration with the University of Ghana to talk about women in the diaspora. So I'm really excited about what that work entails and the great work of uh, Caribbean, particularly Caribbean women scholars who write of Carol Boyce Davies and the like. So the sky's the limit in, talk, in terms of talking about Black women in the global and diaspora context. So that is for me one exciting area in which to write about. The second is about Black women in the arts. Mm -hmm. So it is, for instance, uh, Elizabeth Alexander's uh, book on Trayvon, Trayvon Generation and, and uh, the work that Deborah Willis does. So I'm really excited about the connection between history, the visual representation, and the arts. And so thanks to um, collaborative work and my friendship with Deborah, Willis, who has these fabulous conferences in Johannesburg and Bellagio and the like on the Black literature. I've been going to uh, many more uh, meetings. Um, Fran Wilson and I were at a, I think it was in uh, maybe Florence, Italy, at a Deborah Ray, Deborah Willis conference. And we're, you know, we're historians. We were probably, we were clearly in the minority, but there were all these great scholars who were photographers and visual artists. It was a whole nother world. And so it was so impressive. So one of my most recent articles is in the edited volume that Deb Willis did on the women and the migration. Mm -hmm. So I think this, um, the sky's the limit in terms of where we can take our work. And it really, you know, has to have a much more global blaze. Uh, it, uh, one, it involves uh, the arts and the visual representation. So I was happy, for instance, to teach um, Elizabeth Alexander's book on Trayvon Generation. Mm -hmm. And in fact, my colleagues and I got a grant to introduce more of the arts and visual representation in traditional Black cultural courses that doesn't hasn't always had it. Of course, they were duly impressed with uh, liberated threads mm -hmm. and, and that book. So I think for me, I probably would say this every year, uh, to be a Black women scholar and historian, just particularly fascinated with some of the best work, most engaging work, most exciting work comes out of the work that we do. So my students never thought they would be reading Tanisha Ford's book in a Black culture mm -hmm. class, and they, and they were impressed as as I am about what she wrote. So it's yeah. an exciting time to be in the field. Yeah, I love that book as well. Um, <laughs> and I, I do work on uh, Black artists and visual okay. visual culture. So Wonderful. I'm, I'm oh. glad to hear we have similar interests. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and for me, it, it evolves. I, I didn't start there. Mm -hmm. And so that's a beautiful thing I think about continuing to expand your intellectual interests. Mm -hmm. um, some people, of course, could write about the same thing for the whole career or the same subject, but it's also a, an opportunity to bring in new topics, new questions, new scholarship and the like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what, you know, obviously we talked a little bit about that before, but mm -hmm. one of the things that I think is so, um, what, what draws people to you as a historian and your work is that, you know, you don't just stay in one box. You're talking about Black <laughs> radical women, but, you know, different times and uh, I remember when I yeah. wrote about Odessa Marie Madre, who's now a subject of a film, mm -hmm. and uh, someone encouraged me to send that to Hollywood. Maybe they could make a film about her, and I was telling my students, well, even if I go to Hollywood, I'd come back. I wouldn't leave you straight. <laughs> But it has not been made into a Hollywood movie, even though it should. Yes. But but it was made into a you know a film, and mm -hmm. and I remember uh, in our Black Women and Work Forward Foundation funded grant, uh, 
Dr. Mary Ellen Washington kept wanting me to admit that my parents were numbers backers. And mm. that's why I wrote about that subject. Mm -hmm. I kept trying to say, no, no. But actually, I, I told her, and I've said this to other people, I wish they were because the, per <laughs> the person in high school was the first one to get a car mm -hmm. in the 10th grade was the daughter of a numbers backer family. Oh, wow. yeah. see, and my sister and I had to wait till we were a senior to get a car. We had to share that car. <laughs> so maybe my parents were numbers backers. I yeah. had the car sooner. But <laughs> in any case, um, there is a thread in the people that I write about, and that's that courageous refusal to stay in a in a lane that somebody wants them to be there. And it's the their, you know, the complexity of these people. And I try to get to the how they complex, what motivates them, and like sometimes it's harder than other times. But the thing is, I often say to my students, think about how complex you are. Mm -hmm. And it, you don't always follow the same pattern. And they're like, why would you want a historical figure you're studying to be just that yeah. when you can't even do the same thing in a given week, let alone a given day? So, yeah, exactly. Well, it has been so wonderful talking with you today. Um, Dr. Harley, thank you for being here um, with us uh, this. ABWH Legends interview. Um, is there anything else you want to say before we conclude? No, I just want to say that I'm so excited that ABWH not only exists, and Rosalyn was a key person in that, and I must say I, I was the editor of our first newsletters. I think I have some, so where were we going to ultimately put the papers of ABWH? So it's just here again, we went on faith, and you got, and the Karen ABWH and Erica's leadership and all the other people who've been presidents, Francis uh, Roussan Wilson, that this made this such a phenomenal organization doing such phenomenal things. So I was happy that we uh, that it was formed, that Rosalind was a key person in that. And uh, it's just stolen. Everybody wants to be ABWH. So it's <laughs> just wonderful.